All right. Tonight, our study is called Living Life to the Fullest. And we're talking about taking care of our health and what the Bible says uh, about our health. So how important is our health? Uh, would someone like to read 3 John verse 2? Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, you got the apostles here, John, just talking about how he wishes all of those that he's writing to would be in good health. Some people think, you know, that's it's not that important. As long as you know the right stuff, you believe the right things, you know, you can waste away in a chair. But John says, no, I, I want everyone to be in good health, um, just as well as they were doing spiritually. He wanted them to also be doing physically. Um, and this is an important part. Of, I think uh, the biblical understanding is that, you know, our a healthy body is better in tune with God. We A clear mind is better able to discern what the Spirit is saying. So we want to do what we can to, um, to maintain our bodies because God created us, right? And the better, uh, the better we maintain our health, the more visible God will be um, to us and perhaps even through us. So any thoughts or comments, uh, Elder Frank? Question. The first part, I pray that all may go well with you. Is that something in addition to the health? Um, sounds so, good to me. What'd you say? It sounds good to me. <laughs> Other things beside the health. Yeah. So all, you know, I hope all is going well with you. If I say that to you, of course, that's not health specific. Um, so all, all inclusive. Um, and that you may be in good health um, as it goes well with your soul. So he's saying, you know, as it's going good spiritually, I want it to go good physically and that everything will be going well. I, li I like the uh, positivity of this verse. He's really uh, shining through. So why did God share principles of good health with his people? Would someone like to read Exodus 23, uh, verse 25? You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. All right, thanks. So um, in the book of Exodus, they were leaving um, Egypt. They were coming out from slavery, and God was telling them, you know, some of the principles that would keep them healthy as a nation. And he said, you know, serve the Lord. God will bless you. He's going to provide for you. Um, and as you follow God's guidance, he says, I'm going to take sickness away from among you. Um, wouldn't that be nice not to ever be sick? I, mm -hmm. uh, Frank, you were just told us uh, earlier that you had a cold, getting over a cold. And <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if we never had that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had one uh, last week or a week and a half ago, and it was, uh, it was a tough one. But God promises to take sickness away from among you. So his plan for the nation of Israel was for them to follow his guidance. And as they did that, um, the sicknesses and the diseases of Egypt would not be um, in their nation. They would have different uh, lifestyle that would avoid some of those um, some of those diseases that that Egyptians suffered with. And uh, you know, some of the archaeological evidence from and excavations and things that we know of from ancient Egypt is that they had a lot of the same diseases that we see today uh, in Western societies. What sort of life does Jesus promise us? Anyone like to read this one? John 10, 10. John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. All right. So what does this verse mean? It sounds like the thief and Satan. What about specifically that second part? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He wants us to have an abundant life? Sure. Yeah. So not only is he granting us eternal life, but the life that we are living on earth, he wants it to be 
happy and healthy and enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not, um, it's not just to have, um, you know, like the presence of Jesus. That's very important. That's what we want. That's what he's offering. But in every aspect of life, he's offering us a better, more abundant life. Um, abundant is not a, a word that you hear often, I think, uh, in conversation these days, um, let alone about an abundant living. Um, but what what is an abundant life compared, to, compared to a regular life? Wonderful. Wonderful, full, a full life. Healthy. Healthy. Say that again. Healthy. Healthy, yeah. Healthy. Yeah, so when Jesus came, his purpose was to make life better um, in all aspects, right? So with the presence of Jesus, with health uh, of body, clear mind. So all of that, uh, a full, joy-filled, wonderful life. Um, and probably there's more that we could talk about when you think of abundantly. Um, it's sort of like a, a superlative in my mind. Like there's not a better life that Jesus is offering. Um, it's, I mean, I guess I said that wrong. There's not a, just a regular life. This is the best life that Jesus is offering. You get the idea. What does the Bible call our body? So we're looking at, um, at this verse from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Yeah, thanks for reading that. Um, you know, some people have the attitude like, my body is mine. I can do what I want. Um, I'll eat what I want. If it tastes good, I'd rather have, you know, 50 years of happiness eating whatever I want than, you know, 50 years of misery and good health. <laughs> I've heard that uh, sentiment before. Um, but God wants us to take care of our bodies because it's his temple, right? So, you know, if we if God wants to dwell in us, then we ought to do our best to um, to keep our body as best as we can for uh, for his glory. When it you also, go ahead. It also has to do with choice. Every mm -hmm. moment of the day, we are making choices. Exactly. Um, good choices come from uh, a healthy body, a clear mind, right? So the the greater uh, clarity we have of thought, the better our choices are going to be. And that's what God wants. He wants to have a, a clear mind, not only to help us make good choices, but also to have a better connection with him, to hear his voice, to be able to discern his will, to you know know that when we pray, he's going to answer and have trust in him. Um, all of that comes from the fact that our bodies are his temple, and it's not our bodies, it's his because he bought us with a price. So his death on the cross, when he paid that price for uh, our sins, he bought us. And so the admonition from this verse is to glorify God in your bodies. Um, and I like this, this last phrase of the verse because... We think, you know, I'll glorify God with what I do or with what I say um, by either, you know, sharing how much I love God or by singing praises to him uh, or by giving to other people, you know, what God, you know, the blessing that God has given me. But this goes beyond that to just say that, you know, even in your own body with what you eat, what you drink, what you do, I and mean, we'll see that in a minute, um, but glorify God you know, not outwardly, but inwardly by, by making his temple a strong place to live. Any other thoughts or comments from this verse? Yes, it seems to me okay. we're also talking about being an example and therefore an influence with our body. Yeah, absolutely. Frank? It's incomprehensible to realize, to think of the price that Christ paid for us, what he went through. Yeah. 
And because of that, the Bible says we are not our own, right? He bought us with his blood. So, um, so that gives us to the question of what are some of the practical ways we can enhance our health? Um, and we're looking at just what the Bible says. There's all kinds of good advice out there. Doctors have good advice, um, nutritionists, health professionals. Um, but the Bible is also a source of uh, advice in this area. Uh, let's read this one. Anyone like to read 1 Corinthians 10.31? Thank you. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Yeah, appreciate that. So look at, um, you know, closely related to the last verse we read. This one says, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do. So that's pretty much pretty much includes everything from physical activity, mental activity, um, food, what we eat, what we drink, pretty much everything is included in this. Um, so this is not just a, you know, a plain diet of all protein or low carbs. This is a everything under the umbrella of doing it for the glory of God. Um, it's sort of a lifestyle, wouldn't you say? Yeah, Frank, go ahead. What about the importance of physical exercise? Yeah, do it for the glory of God, right? Because exercise is an important part of maintaining our health. Right. So, um, so I like the I like what the Bible says. It's not just a, a quick, you know, do a thirty day weight loss program or you know twenty days of gaining muscle program, whatever it might be, whatever the new trends are out there. It's an intentionality of doing everything, whether it's eating, whether it's exercising, whether it's our work or our schooling, whatever it is, all of it though, for God's glory. So when did God first speak to the human family about his plan to guide us in good health? Uh, someone read Genesis 1 29. Any volunteer would like to read that? And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant you will be to see, that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. Thank you. So as we look at the creation of the world, then God gave um, food. And as he was talking about food in Genesis 129, what kind of diet was... Uh, our original diet. Vegetarian. Plant-based. Plant Pretty much plant-based, right? Um, every plant yielding seed. So anything on the face of the earth, there has to be thousands of varieties, right? I mean, he said everything over the face of all the earth. <laughs> That's so. There's just got to be a lot. Um, every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So God created a, a plant-based diet um, for us to eat. That was the original diet. Um, as many people know, there was no death until after sin. So there was no killing of animals or eating of their meat uh, until later. But then, uh, then we see, you know, even a little bit later, there were some stipulations on what we could eat. So you have the introduction of animals as sacrifices of death. Um, evidently, somewhere along the lines, people started eating meat. And um, and then in Leviticus, God gave us a little bit more instruction. Um, when God modified his original dietary plan for humanity, what restrictions did he place on what people should and should not eat? Uh, someone read Leviticus 11, verse 3. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven footed and choose the cut and choose the cut among the animals you may eat. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so there are some animals that God says you shouldn't eat. Um, and he says, anything that has a split hoof and choose the cud is good for food. You can eat it. Um, that's thing or animals like cows, right? Beef, um, sheep, those are animals that chew the cud, uh, have cloven hooves. Deer, 
Um, but if it has a cloven hoof, but doesn't chew the cud or choose, um, or vice versa, basically those things are not okay. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Yes, question. Uh, the last part where it says, or choose the cud, uh, the pork, the pig has a cloven hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. Yes. Uh, that itself is a proper example of what we must not eat. Yeah, thank you. I see a couple of hands. I'll start with the Mecca and then we'll go to Betty. So like you said, um, this is a time when there was a distinction, but the distinction actually went back um, to Genesis, was it Genesis 6 or 7? Yeah, we got um, that in my next slide. With, yes, with um, Noah. Um, you know, God had seven of the clean go, go into the ark and two of the unclean go into the ark. And anyone that, you know, and again, uh, after he, they left the ark, um, Noah was permitted to eat meat because the the plants and vegetation, mm -hmm. or many of them was destroyed because of the flood. But in Leviticus is where God is giving um, clear um, insight into what constitutes clean and what constitutes unclean. But that was known even in, in, in Noah's time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we'll see that again in a moment uh, on the next slide, just to reinforce what you said. Uh, this distinction is not new in Leviticus 11. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Betty. Yes, I was thinking about the meat that we eat now where they're injected with different hormones and uh you know things to make them grow i uh would this really apply that today in today's um you know uh, what I'm, I'm trying yeah, yeah I, would I, I would say yes um i know that they inject animals with hormones i know that some uh, meat now is produced in a lab rather than grown on an animal um but we still say that it's all it all falls under the the broader guidelines that the Bible gives us. That uh, animals were given as an emergency food. Unfortunately, people think they're in emergency all the time nowadays, especially in America. And they wonder why heart disease and cancer and strokes are our top killers, even more than COVID or some of these other diseases. Um, and it's not only that, but the way the meat is processed. If you do it the way it's supposed to be done, you have to go to a kosher right. Jewish right. Um, butcher where they drain the blood all out and they're not raised with extra fat. And um, the plant-based diet is the best. And the emergency foods are for emergencies. The Israelites are out in the desert. Did they have gardens? No. After the flood, did they have gardens? No. Anyway, God's way is the best. I've said enough. <laughs> I agree. God's way is the best way. Heidi. Yes. So I have two. There. Okay. Um, what does parts the hoof mean? Um, is that a split hoof? Is that regard? Yeah, a split hoof. Okay. And then my second question is, this is something that's always stumped me a bit, is, um, you know how we we focus on the Ten Commandments and we say, well, the Levitical law is, you know, done away with. Why then does the unclean food part um, still exist of yeah. the Levitical law. You know what I'm asking? Like yeah, I, I do. I'm not I'm not a proponent for unclean food <laughs> by any means, but it's always been something that I've been curious about in terms of um hoping that nobody ever asks me about it because I wouldn't know how to explain that that law is done away with, but yet we hold on to the unclean food. So I'm very glad you asked that question. Um <laughs> Because you're not the only one who's asked that before. So um, the the good answer, uh, the best answer I can give you is you are correct that the Ten Commandments matter. 
Um, and the Levitical, Levitical laws are not something that we keep because Jesus, you know, abolished all of those when he died on the cross. Um, the reason why the health laws are, are still there, and not all of the health laws, by the way, but the clean and unclean foods, um, is because there, if you read the book of Leviticus, there are a number of different things that are unclean. Um, if you touch a dead person, you become unclean for a certain number of days, and there's a certain ritual um, for ceremonial purity, right? Um, there's, there's, I don't remember how many, um, but I do have the ability to look that up after if you're interested. Um, there's probably about 15 different uncleannesses that you can get either touching a dead person or having a baby or whatever it might be. Um, and it's all, un, you, you become unclean for a certain number of days and there either is or is not, depending on what um, form of uncleanness, a ceremonial activity for purification. But for the food, um, there the, it doesn't make you unclean. Um, it is unclean by itself. If you eat it, you're not unclean. Um, it has nothing to do with making you clean or unclean. And there's no time limit on it. So it's always unclean, um, not for 40 days or 30 days or seven days, mm. but forever. So that's why we still hold on to this and, um, and other things we don't because um, this had nothing to do with us and had no length of time where it was unclean. Um, and I think the evidence of why God made this rule is in the uh, the fact that all of these animals that are unclean are bottom feeders and, you know, right. the garbage collectors of the world. And while they taste good, God doesn't want us to eat those things because we're just injecting all of their, you know, garbage into us. Um, mm. And people who are, you know, not church related, not affiliated with any denominations will say the same thing. If, you know, if you want to avoid um, parasites in your brain, don't eat, don't eat pork. <laughs> that's, wow. that's not, um, that doesn't have to come from a Christian source. So mm -hmm. I see I've touched on a, a nerve maybe. So I'll start over here with Thank you. and uh, <laughs> we'll work down with the hands. Hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Well, in other words, what you're saying, Pastor, is we must make a clear distinction between the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament that were done away with and health laws, which, ne which were not done away with. Uh, yeah, and I would even qualify that because some of the ceremonial laws were health-related. I mean, I could classify them as health-related, but, uh, but not all the health laws, but specifically the food laws. Okay, um, Emeka, do you, did you have your hand up? Yes, you um, kind of addressed it already. I, just, I guess I'll be um, short that the the guidance with regard to food and what to eat is something that is carried all through the Bible. Like you mentioned, it's yeah, and, and and what the Bible does. Anyone that studies the Bible realizes that you may not find all the detailed guidance on something to the same level everywhere, but if some place is covered in principle, some places it gets into detail, then there might be another principle again, there might be another detail someplace else, you put everything together. And so if you look at it from Genesis to Revelation, it's very clear that God is, God gave us the plant-based diet. He made allowances because of some circumstances for meat eating. But the goal is to get us to a plant-based diet. I'm sure you're going to cover in, in the slides that in heaven, when God you know, takes his people either by translation or resurrection to heaven, whether those people lived a, had a plant-based diet or a meat diet, when they get to heaven, everyone's going to have a plant-based diet again. And we're not going to be chasing cows and chickens and eating them. Every, all that stuff is that stuff is um you know past and so god instead we're going to be eating the tree of life and you know and isaiah talks about we're going to be planting and and uh, eating the fruit of our own vines so god wants us to move closer to where he wants us to be not just in um, other aspects of lifestyle but even in our diet 
and, and how we take care of ourselves. He wants us to move towards the original plan. Mm, that's right. Uh, Ms. Kika. Yes, good evening. Um, two points, please. First of all, when uh, Noah took the animals on the uh, uh, in the ark, uh, already then he was allowed to take both clean and unclean uh, animals because um, God knew that there would be nothing for them to eat until the seeds grow and so forth, and uh, they had to have food, and so therefore they had the clean animals that they could eat. That's point number one. And um, uh, point number two, uh, um, the question that I could possibly answer to for Heidi is that the reason that this is not part of the Levitical laws is because the animals have never changed. The mm. uh, pig was a pig before the flood and the mm. pig is a pig now. Uh, the mm. reason why they were on the ark both clean and unclean because the unclean animals serve a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, parents had a farm in Brazil, and the uh, black um, pigs were running around and cleaning up what the uh, natives were leaving behind, but then the pigs were right behind it and uh, consumed that. So um, <laughs> actually, they are unclean uh, animals, but they were like a garbage garbage collectors if you please try mm -hmm. to keep the, uh, keep the, earth. the earth clean mm -hmm. so God had a reason for everything and one thing we do know that those that were unclean are still unclean they have not changed no matter how much people try to baptize them and say now they're clean <laughs> yeah thank you man and uh, Toppenberg's I'm so glad that I had godly parents and they instilled within me the desire to achieve the best, be in the best. And uh, the best is revealed in Genesis. And I, it's just, it's actually repulsive to be, to think about doing things that are less good than there are in the beginning. Why should we? do the things that we know are damaging and uh, why should we uh, accept a low standard? Why can't we accept a high standard? And my wife also wanted to say something. Uh, the original diet was fruit, nuts, and grains. And mm -hmm. you'll notice in Genesis, God added vegetables mm -hmm. after sin. So I have one more question. All right, yeah. Uh, it's a, uh, go, comes up for debate every once in a while in my family. Did Jesus eat fish? Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. He even <laughs> served it to the uh, apostles when they came out after they fished all night and they were hungry. Jesus already had prepared their breakfast for them. He was frying fish for them and gave it to them. Did he eat? <laughs> I think so. He did. I, I, I doubt very much that he would not have. But uh, you can I, you can look at the biblical evidence and make your own determinations. We've got to move on. And uh, here's uh, Genesis 7, verse 2, which we had already uh, alluded to. Um, were the restrictions on eating unclean animals intended only for the Jewish people? Genesis chapter 7 2 tells us the distinction that God gave the animals um, to Noah to take on the ark. It says, You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. So God said, Seven animals clean on the ark and unclean two. So they didn't go two by two, they went seven by seven and then two by two. Um, on the ark. And this was before there were any Jewish people. There were just people. <laughs> All right. Any comments or questions on this? I think we uh, hit this already once. So that's the distinction. Um, so we'll get back to Leviticus 11, 9 and 10. Would someone like to read this for us? I could read it. Thank you. Leviticus 11, 9 and 10. 
These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the scales or in the rivers, pardon me, whether in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. But anything in the seas or the rivers that does not have fins and scales of the swarming creatures in the waters and of the living creatures that are in the waters is detestable to you. Well, yeah. So thank you for reading that for us. Um, here we're looking at things with fins and scales. All right. Um, pretty simple. If your fish comes with fins and scales, then you can eat it. If it doesn't have fins and scales, it's unclean. Don't eat it. Uh, examples of that would be like lobster and shrimp and oysters and all of those things that um, people eat where I grew up uh, are unclean. Um, and I want to point out here that last phrase, it says, is detestable to you. Um, in some versions, it'll say it's an abomination. And there's nowhere in the Bible where God declares something to be an abomination or detestable that he later reverses and says is okay. Hmm. That gives us a good indication that it's best to avoid these things that the Bible says, that God says to avoid, right? So we've looked at the land animals, we've looked at the sea animals. Well, what about um, birds? Leviticus 11, 13. Uh, someone like to read this for us? I'll read that. And these you shall detest among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are detestable. The eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture. Yeah. And there's, a, if you read on uh, the next few verses, there's a whole list of other other birds that are not uh, not good. But things like chicken, turkey, those are clean. Those were permitted for um, for consumption. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you'll have to give up your uh, camel burgers. Um, you know, all those uh, oysters and fish that are... All the bottom feeders. Fins and scales, roaches, the yeah. bottom feeders, yeah. Mm -hmm. All those things are, are not for our consumption. Right. Any other comments? Uh, we're going to move off the food. And move over to uh, the beverages. Question. Question. Uh, the reason the eagle and the others, the black eagle and the vulture, uh, are not supposed to be eaten is because of what they eat, because of their mm -hmm. diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like the pig and the other things, too. Yep. Basically, if they're scavengers, um, they're not for for food. Good, good observation. So here's another uh, topic. Does God speak in favor of consuming alcohol? Let's read Proverbs 20 and 23. Uh, any volunteer like to read these two verses? I'll read them. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. In Proverbs 23, 31 through 33 says, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. Mm -hmm. So here's uh, two examples of what the Bible says about wine, about alcohol, um, fermented you can clearly tell in uh, Proverbs 23 that this is talking about fermented grape juice, right? It's not talking about fresh grape juice. It's talking about when it sparkles, when it goes down smoothly, it bites. Um, and, you know, your eyes see strange things. Nobody's ever experienced that by drinking grape juice, you know, Welch's or um, St. Julian's or whatever, whatever variety of grape juice you like. Um this is talking about alcohol. Um, so the Bible does talk about drinking alcohol in an unfavorable light. There are people, there's examples of people who are drinking alcohol, but they're never portrayed positively. Um, and there's other things in the Bible that are spoken about, but we can't use to justify actions today, like um, bigamy or owning slaves, right? Just because they had some in Bible times does not make it an argument for doing it today. 
Um, so what um, what we see here is that there's a differentiation in wine in the Bible. Um, just like there's clean and unclean, there's good and bad wine. And what wine does God recommend people to freely consume? We find in Isaiah 65, verse 8. Would anyone like to read this? Okay. Thus is the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. Yeah. So wine found in the cluster, that's clearly a reference to the grapes, uh, fresh grape juice. Um, a lot of people say, you know, there's the, the health benefits of drinking wine. Uh, there's way more from drinking grape juice. The same benefits magnified uh, way more than drinking wine. Uh, Ms. Kika. Yes, um, I just want to get back to the question, I believe Heidi Lan asked about whether Jesus ate fish. And I would like to call the attention to what it says in Luke, when they didn't believe that Jesus had a body, it says that, uh, but while they will still did not believe for joy that he was resurrected and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. So Jesus did eat fish and other food that was presented that was clean. All right. Thank you. Um, so we look at this. The Bible was, is fairly consistent uh, with itself, as we've always uh, tried to notice, that even when Jesus went to the wedding and turned water into wine, um, he did not turn it into alcohol. He turned it into grape juice, um, the good wine, as the Bible refers to it, and as they referred to it at the wedding. Um, for Jesus to turn it into alcohol uh, would just be really inconsistent with his character of trying to save people to, uh, to make choice of salvation and then to inhibit their ability to do that by creating alcohol. It just seems like it wouldn't be in character for Jesus to do that. Um, so that's uh, that's what the Bible says about um, alcohol. We would We would say that if it doesn't enhance your body, if it doesn't bring health to your body, um, probably avoid it right? There's a lot of things that are harmful to your body that are not alcoholic beverages. Um, so it's just better to think about this, you know, whether you eat or whatever you drink, whatever you do, you know, do it for the glory of God. If, if it can help you and build you up, go for it. If it destroys you, your body and impairs your abilities, avoid it. Does it matter to God if people smoke or use tobacco products? This one um, probably wouldn't have been the first verse to come to your mind, but Jesus cares about our bodies. The Bible um, writers clearly cared about the health of the people they were writing to. And so when we look at Exodus 20, verse 13, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. Um, you know, science reveals that every cigarette smoked causes a lot of harm on our mind and our bodies. 90% um, of lung cancer is caused by smoking. Um, I mean, that's intentional, significant harm to the body where God lives, where his temple is. So that's something that we should not do. We should not kill ourselves slowly over years of smoking. Um, we should honor God by giving glory to him in all that we do and making his temple as healthy as possible. So God does not want us to smoke or use tobacco products. The Bible does not say anything about cigarettes, but uh, the principles of, of smoking and the harm it does are clear that God doesn't want us to do that. Toppenberg's. Yes, one cigarette is uh, told, and if you do a five-day plan, they'll tell you one cigarette shortens your life by five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's better to avoid uh, anything harmful. Um, cigarettes, tobacco products, other drugs that are not helpful, healthful. Um, if they don't strengthen us, if they don't connect us closer with the Lord, make us healthier, best to stay away from those. Um, and here's a, a good principle that helps us 
Um, and Paul described the Christian journey um, towards our heavenly home this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Um, would someone like to read this verse? Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, you know, when um, when Paul's writing here, he's talking about the runners in the race. They all run, you know, but only one gets the prize. Um, and every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Other versions will say they're temperate in all things. Um, so, you know, you can take a good thing and have too much of it and make it into a bad thing, right? Uh, if if all you eat is one thing over and over and over and over, even though it's good for you, you're going to be losing the nutrients from all the other good things. Um, so temperance is a, a wonderful principle um, that's, that is moderation and of every good thing and abstaining from every harmful thing. And that means that, um, you know, we're living for the glory of God. So we're, we're living uh, to keep our bodies in the um, ultimate uh, healthful condition. This, um, this is not uh, something that we often think about when, you know, as Christians, we're thinking more of, you know, what, uh, what other Bible topics are there that are important? What's God's plan for my life? But God wants us to be healthy. Um, we don't eat our way into heaven. We don't drink our way into heaven, right? But this is a result of of just wanting to do our best to please God, um, to be a temple for him to dwell in. What great biblical principle reminds us of the importance of honoring God with our bodies? Would someone read Romans 12, verse 1? Yes, Betty. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Mm -hmm, thanks. Yeah, so Paul's appeal is, you know, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So all that we do is, you know, living for God, um, surrendered to him, offered to him um, in everything. And he says that's your spiritual worship. Um, your reasonable act of worship, other translations will say your spiritual service or reasonable service. If you remember where we started out, um, above all things to be well and in good health. John says, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So it's important to God that we are doing well, physically, spiritually, in every way. He wants us to be healthy. And Paul says, I'm appealing to you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice might be another way of saying, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Yeah, Pastor, I was going to say that it really highlights the importance of moderation and self-control. Because we know that appetite, even if you eat good things, you can overdo it and you can obsess about it. It's about basically trusting the Lord and having the, um, the Holy Spirit giving you temperance and balance which we have a hard time doing on our own yeah yep god wants us to be uh to be balanced temperate um as we looked at in first corinthians 9 24 and 25 um you know we're not trying to get a gold medal we're trying to get a golden crown Amen. And so we want to put ourselves in the best, most advantageous position possible. Um, and that starts by glorifying God with what we eat, too, and, and our health. Uh, Top and birds. I, I wanted to say that um, everything that God says would be better for us not to do usually has something to do with the frontal lobe where we hear him speaking. Ca caffeine and um tobacco and marijuana they all shut off the frontal lobe i know some people serve coffee before they have a bible study but that physiologically is the worst thing to do all right yeah thank you it's always better to follow god's advice 
and um, do what he says. In um, Philippians 4, 13, you know, where can a person find the strength to adopt the health principles recommended by God? Uh, Nathaniel, would you read this one for us? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. So where does a person's strength come from? Uh, it comes from God. You know, you might think, I can't do that. I can't give up all of these foods that I love, or I can't, you know, these beverages that I enjoy. But through God's strength, uh, we can. Uh, the, God gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us, you know, what we need to change our lives. Uh, but it's His strength. You know, when you're committed to living for God's glory, He's going to do a work in your heart that makes it possible where you don't um, you don't desire those things anymore. Um, so what seems impossible for us in our own human weakness is possible with God's strength. Um, and he can help anybody enjoy the blessings that he wants us to have uh, by following his health principles. So um, so I want to encourage all of us that are here and all those that are listening that, you know, through God's power, things that might seem impossible are possible. Um, and when it comes to food, we this is one area where people don't really like to change, but it's possible with God's help. If it seems impossible to, uh, to adopt a better lifestyle, or we've tried and we failed, you know, we keep going back to the old uh, things that are in our uh, refrigerators, you know, we don't have to be discouraged by that. God can help us. So, I want to ask, uh, like we do at the end of every meeting, this question, are you willing to surrender your life to God and accept his principles for better physical and spiritual health? And I hope Amen. the answer to um, this question for all of us will be yes. Um, to study God's word, find the principles for our spiritual health and our physical health and, uh, and live them out because um, that's God's plan for us. Um, please bow your heads with me. Uh, we'll have a, a word of prayer to end our study. Lord, I want to pray that you will give us uh, help and encouragement to live out the principles that are set out in your word, that we would have a clear and uh, constant connection with you, that our bodies will be a place uh, where you will long to live and dwell because we have created a, a place where, um, where you can live. Uh, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We've been called to glorify you. Help us to be temperate in all things and to uh, experience the abundant life that Jesus promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.